Hi, everybody. My name is Uma Mishra Newberry. I am the Executive Director of Women's March Global. And today I have the very distinct um, pleasure to be in a webinar discussion with Natalie from Women's March Kingston. Now, before I get started with Natalie and, and introduce her fully, I want to just talk about the upcoming Women's Day. As you all know, we have our upcoming global anniversary of event um, called the Women's Wave this year. And this year, the um, focus of our global anniversary is end violence against women. The reason why the upcoming anniversary has this theme is because the statistics and the numbers of the violence that women and girls experience around the world is staggering. One in three girls and women will experience violence. The most unsafe place for a woman is her own home. And globally, the, the statistics are just something that I have difficulty stomach, stomaching every single day. And I know that many, many other people do. So throughout the next couple of days and, and the next two weeks, we're gonna be hosting webinar. We're gonna be hosting webinar discussions with um, some of our community members to really talk about why this issue is such a global issue and why we are organizing around this issue this year and why this is our central theme. So with that being said, um, I would like to introduce Natalie from Women's March Kingston. And just to preface here, if you would like to leave questions for us, please do so. Um, on our Facebook Live. So for those of you watching um, Facebook Live, thank you and welcome. Um, please leave any questions that you have for myself or Natalie on Facebook Live and we would be happy to answer them um, next time. So our webinar agenda is here. We're just gonna ha be having an open discussion with Natalie Stack from Women's March Kingston. Natalie, I'm just gonna turn this over to you. I would love for you to introduce yourself um, and, and who you are and where you come from, and we'll really dive into it. Okay. So my name is Natalie Stack, and I was born in Jamaica. Um, I'm currently living in Atlanta, Georgia. And recently, um, we have had a, a rise in violence against women and girls in Jamaica. Um, this has been ongoing for over a decade, but it has, it's gotten really bad in the past year or two. And so I saw that and felt the need to bring Women's March to Jamaica. And living here in the States, I've seen how Women's March has impacted not just America, but around the globe. So, there in Jamaica, we have uh, several different women's organizations, and we do have some laws on the books for women. But for some reason, there is there's something wrong there. You know, it's not it's not making an impact on the wider society. And so, our goal here with Women's March in Jamaica is to bring awareness. And you know, we basically have an urgency in the rate at which women are dying and the nature of the crime. Um, uh, we, we launched in Jamaica in October of 2018. And we had different women at the launch. We had attorneys that are familiar with the laws as they are. We had uh, women from different women's organization and we just wanted to get a feel of what the climate was like in Jamaica for um, gender-based violence and the laws. Now, the laws that we have on the books right now, they were under review by the former prime minister and these laws that she wanted to review uh, were the Sexual Offenses Act, the Offenses Against the Persons Act, the Domestic Violence Act and the Child Care Act and the protection. So these, these, these laws were reviewed, but they have not been passed. She was also looking at punishment and, you know, assault on women, especially pregnant women and the elderly. Um, so we have a new administration right now. I think 
they are in the process of uh, passing these laws, I'm not absolutely sure because I haven't heard any more about it. But there is an urgency, and that's the message that we want to get out there. I'm in the process right now of forming a committee in Jamaica with Women's March. And on that committee, we're trying to get women from many factions of society. Um, we're trying to get women, one, one woman per parish. We have 14 parishes or four states, as you would call it here. And so we want to get one representative from each parish to come together on a committee and we want to meet and in the future, near future, we'd like to have members of parliament at the table, including the prime minister, so that we can talk about how gender-based violence affects women, our children, families, and society as a whole, and make some proposals um, in terms of what we need to see happen for this gender-based violence to be eliminated. Amazing, thank you so much, Natalie. And um, you know, as you said, you're trying to work at, with Women's March Kingston in all different levels from, you know, gathering women and talking about these issues, but then also really um, working with local government and then also your, your federal government to really push for legislation. So on this slide right now, everyone can see what your five key objectives are that you have laid out and you and your, your um, team have laid out for Women's March Kingston. Can you talk through a little bit about your focus areas and how you're working through um, you know, these, these objectives? Yes, so raising awareness of what is happening to our women and girls. I think um, the launch that we did, that was pretty effective. Um, we do a lot of social media activities um, I've been in contact with women there. One of the women uh, is the former deputy police commissioner. She's a woman and she's doing some activism work in Jamaica. And she has a pretty good idea of what's happening. And I have other women that are more than willing to join the committee and, you know, they're aware of what's happening and they will you know, talk about it among themselves there in Jamaica, and hopefully we'll get together sometime to um, uh, speak to each other on a committee. One of the things to, to, to raise awareness that I think is important to start with is to start an awareness campaign by using, you know, things like billboards in Jamaica and putting signs and um, information in places that women visit, such as her doctor's office, or maybe the hospital, you know, things in the workplace, just to put things out there visually for women to see, not just women, but men as well, um, just to let people know that we have a problem here and, you know, put the resources out there, such as where can we call if we're having trouble? You know, where can we find a women's shelter? You know, where can we get some counseling? Because that information can be limited as not everyone has access to the internet, for example. You know, so I think that's good to raise awareness. Um, in terms of increasing legislative action by the government, I think it's very important that these laws that were reviewed be passed. Um, I feel like uh, punishment especially must be reviewed because we've had instances where, you know, for uh, the, the murder of a woman, for example, you see uh, plea bargains being done in these cases and, you know, people getting out on parole after 10 years and committing the same crime all over again. So I think that we need to get a little more strict with the laws and um, the, the legislations, like I said, that was reviewed, they, they must be passed. And also the government I believe should invest financially into resources. We need to have several women shelters. We, our population is 2.9 million. And one shelter, one uh, battered women's shelter won't do it. We have to come up with more shelters because there are some rural parts of Jamaica where you know resources such as these are limited. So I think this needs to be spread out all across the island, not just in the capital of Kingston. So um, education, uh, resources such as shelters, counseling, 
Um, I think that uh, the laws that were reviewed must be passed. And there are other things along the way, mm -hmm. such as one of, the, one of the things that I think it would be a good idea was to have uh, maybe some psychologists put some psychologists in our schools, ask for people to volunteer to do that so that we can re-socialize, which is the next point, re-socialize our young men and women, you know? And I think that um, that, should, that should be impactful for our next generation. Teach them how to treat each other. Absolutely. And you know, what's acceptable and what is not acceptable, you know? Um, to point number four, to create a women's group in every community across Jamaica, I think that's important. And um, it would just, you know, get women to be a little more aware because sometimes, sometimes you find that, you know, abuse can be only seen as physical abuse. Mm -hmm. And so psychological and verbal abuse, we need to emphasize on those things so that, you know, we're just more educated as a society about what's acceptable and what is not acceptable because sometimes these things are acceptable and the next thing you know, there's a domestic violence dispute and the next thing is physical violence and it, that's what we're seeing these days you know in jamaica so point number five um i spoke about encouraging the government to source the battered women shelter initiative among other things and that is what um we would like to do with our summit that we are going to plan for this year so at the table, we want to have the Prime Minister, we want to have the Minister of Health, we want to have the Minister of Gender Affairs, and we wanna we wanna talk about this, you know, we wanna we wanna present scenarios of women or even men um, in situations where you know it's a it's a domestic dispute, there's no way out, and so there has to be government programs that can foster the attention and the care that uh, women need. Because oftentimes, and we see this a lot lately, oftentimes we see a domestic dispute and the woman gets killed and the children get killed in between all of that. Mm -hmm. So it is important to have a place of refuge, you mm -hmm. know, not just one, but several. Um, the age of consent, our age of consent in Jamaica is 16. <laughs> And that is the case in some parts of the world as well, especially underdeveloped places in the world. And I believe that um, we have a problem in Jamaica as well with um, child rape, okay? And at 16 years old, I don't know what else a 16-year-old can consent to do besides sex, because children cannot drink, a 16-year-old cannot drink legally in Jamaica and they can't vote. So with that, raising the age of consent is saying that we are not going to facilitate or encourage child molestation. And so I think that um, with the situation with pedophiles, you know, we can, we can help eliminate that and um, encourage growth, you know, before uh, putting, putting children especially girls, 16 year old girls in a position where they, they're pregnant at 16 and being forced to raise a family. And oftentimes they have to do that alone or the burden falls on families and society because they're not ready at 16 to have children and have a, a family. So I think raising the age of consent would work for both sides, you know what I mean? I, you know, everything that you're highlighting here, Natalie, it. it there's so many, there's so many layers. And I think people have to understand the immense work that you are undertaking, you and your team are undertaking to really not only change the narrative, but literally change how young people are educated, how that translates into policy, how it translates into the way that we, even as grown women, think about it and how women in Jamaica think about these issues and advocate for these issues. So it's a lot of, really detailed and very intricate work to push the needle forward in a way that is is definitely Im impactful. Um, yeah. You brought up a little bit um, some of the cases you just spoke about when 
women are murdered, their, their kids are also murdered. And, and you've seen this in Jamaica. And, and um, I remember an email that you wrote to me just about some of the headlines and some of the things that were in the news recently about the violence against women in Jamaica. So if you could, I would like for you to talk about um, just some of the statistics that you see in Jamaica that women are experiencing and, um, you know, and, and why it's so prevalent. So the UN just recently did their very first national survey for women in Jamaica back in June of 2018. And that survey uh, revealed that one in every four women in Jamaica experience um, violence in intimate partner situations, right? And um, sometimes data can be a little conflicting because of course we're still developing, but this is good. You know, I was very happy to see that a national survey was done. Um, I think that um, as a result of this survey, there was also a release by the UN saying that because of the data situation that they have, they, it's going to be hard to fix because without proper data, they cannot fix these things specifically. You know, so we have to work on better data keeping. And um, yeah, most of these most of these cases that we see happening, they are happening to women actually to be frank with you they're mostly happening to women between the ages of you know say 20 25 29 years old but we've also seen cases of um rape and murder of five-year-old girls you know the elderly um we've seen an increase i believe last year we had 11 uh re either returning residents or tourists that have been killed and I think these women, uh, uh, well, most if not all of them were killed by people that they know, you know, so it's not just a random act of violence, it's people that they know and it's, there's really no way to tell what transpired between these people when it comes to um, our returning residents and tourists, but under normal circumstances and for the people uh, that live in Jamaica, I think that we need to learn about conflict resolution. I think that should be a big part of it. Um, I was talking to someone this morning and she told me that um, one of the things that she would like to see in Jamaica is um, that women cannot go to the courthouses and try and drop a case against their abused partner. You know, here in the United States, they've changed that, I believe over a decade ago, where if a police officer is called in a domestic violence dispute, they have to arrest someone because we've seen cases where the officers go there, they de-escalate they de things, and next thing you know, someone turns up dead. So they have to arrest someone. So I think that in Jamaica, that's how these cases should be treated. Once someone calls and say that there's domestic violence happening, that it should go through the process, and you know, the court should treat it like they would anything else. And uh, I don't believe that they should give someone a chance to say, oh, don't worry about it, you know, because then that can turn into something else and then we have to start the process all over again and go back to square one. Now, can I ask, um, you know, the, the range of ages um, that you mentioned, 25 to 29 years old, but then also girls as young as five years old, what is yeah. it um, that you believe to be one or a few of the root causes of just this level of violence that the women are experiencing. I'm asking because in one of um, the recent conversations I had um, in regards to what's happening in India, this question came up as well, you know, and, and um, one of the things that we came to was, was toxic misogyny, toxic patriarchy and how it's really deeply embedded itself, um, not only in the hearts and minds of people, um, but how that's been carried forward. So I wonder if you could speak to, you know, when we're when we're really talking about re-education and, and um, working with kids to break free of the narratives. What are what are these narratives that that 
we're having to break free from. Yes, it is in fact um, what you just mentioned about toxic patriotic uh, patriarchalism, and, and um, that's how we've always been cultured. Is that you know the male figures are superior and the girls are supposed to be women, you know, girls and women as we were conditioned to be um, in society. And so that sort of, uh, that sort of fosters um, all sorts of abuse on women and girls. And um, one of the things also is that in, in politics, women are underrepresented, you know, and even with women in politics, uh, I don't believe that we are we are pushing this agenda of eliminating violence against women as we should. You know what I mean? So, and then you have the laws that are there. I don't believe they are enforced as they should. So I think the cards are pretty much stacked against women and girls in Jamaica. Um, we've tried, you know because we have, we have child agencies, we have um, the Sexual Assault Act, we have different things to accommodate women, but for some reason, Uma, they're, just, they're just not working, you know? And so I believe that um, simple laws such as the Sexual Harassment Act, you know, we, we have to get those passed because it is not uncommon to be walking on the street and have a, a gentleman pass by and, you know, try and talk to us. And if we don't respond, he'll touch us and that's okay. You know, so we have to have those laws passed. We have to look at the punishment. And so I think that people will be a little more reluctant with quite frankly, harsher punishment for these crimes. So it's a, it's a, it's a cultural thing that we need to break and it, it begins in childhood. And that's why one of the most important thing is to start re-socializing our children in school. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. Yeah. And I think exactly what you said, you know, when you actually deliver justice in a way where there is a consequence to these, these really heinous crimes, then hopefully that starts to change the narrative and change the way that people think about how they treat women. And I think also another point that you, that you said, Natalie, is that you know, um, you've tried for a very long time to change this kind of mindset and it's incredibly difficult. And I think that that sentiment is felt by women around the world. We have tried for, for many years now to get men to understand that they're way of treating women, their way of viewing women of, as either as property or, you know, having the sense of entitlement or not taking ownership for their actions is not okay. And it's taken in countries, in some countries, it's taken hundreds of years to get to that place, but then in other countries, it's still very far behind. And so you see the prevalence of, you know, very, very, very young girls being raped, you know, yeah. all the elderly, as you mentioned, because of the fact that these mindsets haven't shifted. But it's not yeah. only men that are the that are the carriers of these mindsets, it's also women. You know, there's that great quote, I think, by Gloria Steinem that says, patriarchy, um, you know, we are not, we don't just live in patriarchy, patriarchy lives within us. And so yeah. if we're not doing the work to break free from the burdens and the chains of it, then we're just reifying it and carrying yeah. it. And to that point um, about uh, children being raped and everything like that, um, we don't have legal abortion in Jamaica. And with the prevalence of sexual violence against children, I believe that it is so important that we have, um, that we legalize abortion. We've had different um, women in parliament, maybe one or two women in parliament and different um, women's group in Jamaica, they've been calling for the government to, to legalize abortion for a long time, but it hasn't happened. We're, we're operating on the British 
system for the most part. And um, we our, our abortion law, I think it's been there since the 1800s, right? And so the British changed that. After we became an independent country and everything, the British, they, they changed their laws. Abortion is legal in the UK, um, I think since 1960. So if a girl in Jamaica is raped, and there was just a recent case where a 12 year old girl, she accused a pastor, a 59 year old pastor, I think of rape. And this case has been dragging for one year. He's been on bail for a year. Um, they've done the DNA testing, which came back positive that he's the father of the child. Um, and um, when children are raped, I mean, as a mom, as a mom, if my 12 year old child is raped, I don't believe that I would want to see her carry that baby, you know, whether or not I'm religious and people have their religious preferences, but some of us also have our, our, our beliefs that, you know, a child is just a child and uh, no one should ever be forced to carry the child of a rapist. And of course, you know, there's, there's incest and there are medical reasons why abortion is necessary. You know, so I think we're at that point in, in, in society where, you know, we should really give women and girls the freedom to say, I don't want to carry the child of a rapist or I don't want to have a botched abortion. You know, there are cases where these abortions are performed and young girls end up dying as a result. So we have to take better care of our, our women and girls in Jamaica. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the point that you brought up, this fight for a woman's bodily autonomy is one that we see happening worldwide. You know, the, the right to be who we are as women and have complete ownership of our, of our choices, of our choices of our health and our bodies is something that women have been fighting for, for for many, many years. And we just saw this past year, finally, Ireland, you know, and, and just passed into law and, and now abortions are available in Ireland as of, as of, you know, one day ago, um, you know, but that fight has been going on for decades. And even in Argentina, um, last year, the vote didn't pass, but activists have been at this, this progressive movement to really push for a woman's bodily autonomy for many years. And I know that they will succeed, but again, we see this resistance to actually giving women and girls the right to have the choice over their own bodies. Um, and it's again, this system of patriarchy that, that refuses to be pushed um, into, into allowing women to really just simply exist. Um, yeah. Have those choices. Another thing that I wanted to um, talk about, which I will present you know, to our committee once we get to that point, I believe it's uh, New Zealand or Ireland, I cannot remember exactly, which country, but they just passed a law there uh, which gives um, a victim of domestic violence, I believe 10 days paid leave to leave their abuser. And one country, they just passed a new law to include psychological abuse as a part of domestic violence. If we can encourage our government to incorporate those things into our domestic violence, bill or our domestic violence act i think that would be a wonderful thing but again we have to have the resources you know to facilitate the laws absolutely now um on the screen we have some of the recent headlines that you had sent to me on email of um what is what has happened can you talk about one or two of the cases that still stick in your mind um you know even after they've transpired yes the one that still hurts, but the one that really just shook me to the core was um, the one of Yatanya Francis. Yatanya was uh, 14 years old. She's a high school girl. And I know that neighborhood really well. Um, her, mom, her mother sent her out to get some food. Um, it was just, just getting dark. And her mother could not find her. And later on that night, the mother said that she smelled something burning you know, but she thought that it was a tire or maybe an animal or something. Um, the following morning, someone stumbled upon Yatanya's body behind a church. She was raped. 
her throat was slashed and she was burned to death. Um, there's just no words to, there, there's no words to really explain how terrible this is. Um, I've never seen anything like this in Jamaica happen to a girl that age. Back in 2011, we had a mother and daughter that were beheaded. So um, it's just it's it's just never ending with these cases. They happen, and you know we talk about it for nine days, and then after that, there's nothing. The last I heard about Yatanya's case, they had a suspect in custody. I have not heard about any charges. I've not heard about any penalties. So, you know, it's just one of those things. Um, the missing British woman that was found in a shallow grave. She was a returning resident. Uh, she was 44 years old. Her name was Karen Cleary. She was returning to Jamaica to build her dream home, and um, she went missing for, I believe, 14 or 15 days, and she was later found in a shallow grave. Um, the guy that is accused of the crime, he was held. He's in custody, as we speak, and he was charged for her murder. Uh, his defense was that they had some dispute over payment because she hired him to do some work. So that's just another one. And um, I believe not even a week later, um, another British woman, I believe she was a photographer. She was found dead. Um, uh, uh, another 13 year old earlier in 2018, she was, her remains actually, were found and her teacher is accused of the crime. He's held, but um, they found her remains in a bathtub soaked in chemicals. I don't know what that's all about, but it is quite disgusting, you know? So these are just a few of the cases that we have seen in Jamaica happening to girls as young as 13, high school girls and, you know, middle-aged women and We've had cases of uh, elderly returning residents, you know, and it just goes on and on. So at this point, I think um, we've had the marches, Uma. We've had the marches. We've had the protests. When we had a 16-day um, protest to eliminate um, gender-based violence, we had our school children marching. You know, we had different organizations marching. But beyond the march, there has to be something else. And that something, I believe, is the government's plan to step in with the legislation and the funds and the programs and the awareness and the education. You know, we have to take this more seriously and treat it accordingly. Absolutely. And, you know, as you, as you said, you know, just your recounting of these cases and the names of, of these women and these girls, there's so many women um, whose names that, you know, we could read out that were murdered last year. Um, and so many girls that were raped last year whose names we could read out. And then there are so many whose names we don't know, whose cases yeah. are unreported, um, you know, that the government hasn't tracked. Um, mm -hmm. and, I think that it's such an important reminder that this is indeed a global issue. This is not isolated to Jamaica alone. It's not isolated to India. It's not isolated, you know, to to the La Mandana in Spain, the Wolf Pack in Spain. Um, you know, it's these the violence that women and girls are experiencing worldwide is there are no words for it which is why it's our focus. So one of the last questions that I want to ask you, um, you know, I, we have written down why is this important, but we know why it's important, but what is the government you have brought up that you're um, doing um, this, this gathering later this year um, that you would like the prime minister to attend, but what is the government doing even right now, given that there have been so many cases in the past year in Jamaica? Well, we have a problem with crime in Jamaica in general. We've been struggling with this for several decades. And the government is approaching 
the government is approaching crime um, without looking at, and I, I, I don't know, I don't know if, if they have any plans in the future to approach gender-based violence, but they're just approaching crime as a whole. But of course, in the midst of all of that, we have the women's issues that is so delicate, you know, and we have to separate that. Um, one of the things that I, that I think that should be changed and would be effective for the gender-based violence in Jamaica is we have a minister of, we have a minister with a portfolio of gender affairs, sports, entertainment, culture, and community development. So those are five tasks that I just named. Um, I believe that gender affairs should be removed from that por portfolio and it should be treated by itself, you know, because the, the, the situation is, is it's just so complex that you cannot pile that into things like culture and, you know, entertainment and sports. You have to separate it and treat it as one entity and put, you know, the surround it with people that are experts at it, people that, that are passionate about it and people that can handle it. And so give them the risk, give that person or a group of people the resources that they need to treat the gender-based violence in the country. We cannot, we cannot lump it into everything else. We have to separate it and understand that it needs special attention because it is so complex. And it has to be a long-term plan. You know, we cannot just talk about it or, you know, pass these laws and be over with it. We need a long-term plan and we need to be monitoring it we need to be gathering data from it so that we can see progress or how how better we can approach it, you know? Absolutely. Um, and I think that, you know, as you said, Natalie, the, the government has to do more. And we see, especially within any negotiation, anytime a government is negotiating anything that has to do with women's issues, you know, intersecting with other issues, women's issues are the first to go off of the table in those negotiations. They're not yeah. sent um, at all. So this is why in this upcoming women's wave that we have now close to 60 marches happening, 60 events happening um, in, over, in, in over five continents um, around the world. The theme for us at Women's March Global this year is to end violence against women because this is, the statistics are so incredibly dire. We need governments to understand that these issues, just as Natalie has said, need to be centered, need to be made a priority because five-year-old girls being raped, 12-year-old girls being raped and then asked to carry those pregnancies to term is unacceptable. Women experiencing violence, you know, in, in the rates that we are is unacceptable. Um, and I think this statistic of one in three really needs to sit with everyone. One, every single person, every single person that will watch this webinar and is watching this webinar knows three women. One in three of those women has experienced violence. Yes, we've had, since Women's March launched, um, the people on my social media um, page they have shown great appreciation for the time and effort that we have put into this organization and launching it in Jamaica. I think they have somewhat lost faith in, um, in how the country is approaching gender-based violence, you know, and I can be pretty outspoken and talk about the issues as they are without, you know, worrying about, you know, hurting someone's feelings or something like that. And so we've had so many women, Uma, reach out to us and have shared their stories. You know, we've had women asking, what can we do to help? You know, so it's something that um, I hope that we can get more, more women, more committed women um, with the time to just you know, jump in and see how we can we can try and get our government's attention, because 
I don't know if you saw what happened in Africa recently with their summit and inviting their prime minister. I don't think that, I don't think that people know sometimes what gender-based violence is all about. You know, I don't think they know how deeply this affects women and not just women, but you know, when, when we're not, when we're not happy and healthy, our children are not happy and healthy. And so our household is not happy and healthy and then everything just becomes so toxic. Absolutely. So I think we have to, we have to speak with our government directly so that they can get a deeper understanding of what this is all about, how urgent it is that we act before it is too late. And we, we just can't turn back. Mm. Now, my last question for you, Natalie, is that, you know, uh, many people watching this are going to feel very removed from Jamaica. They probably never visited it. They probably, they may not know anyone who's Jamaican. Um, yeah. Yet, this singular issue of violence against women is something that connects all of us, regardless yeah. of our, our geographical location. So what would you say to another ally, another person in another country as to how they could support Women's March Kids and how they could support your efforts? Around. Well, we have, um, uh, we have a social media page on Facebook. We also are on Twitter. And of course, we're on the Women's March Global website. If they want to support us, um, they can always reach out to any of these um, website or social media um, pages. Um, we are a nonprofit organization, and so any donation that we can get would would be, be would be greatly appreciated, and it would help. Um, just whatever advice you know that we can get. Um, I've often looked at other countries and see how they handle gender-based violence over time. You know because it always comes down to government. You know, it always comes down to government. Of course, the activism is important because we're the ones who bring these issues to the forefront. And so if there are any activists or any advocates around the world that would like to give us some ideas and, you know, support us in any way that they can, they can reach out to us and we're always open to ideas, you know. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you for taking the time to join us and to share not only your work and what Women's March Kingston is doing, but what you are pushing forth with in regards to your plans and also the situation um, in Jamaica and what women and girls are experiencing. Thank you for sharing that. I know that it's not easy, but I, I so value the work that you do and, and I know that many others do as well. Thank you for having me, Uma. Not a problem. For, th Have a good day. For, those of, for those of you who are just joining us, this video will be embedded on our Facebook page. Um, so please have a look at the full conversation with Natalie and Women's March Kingston. And remember that we are very, very, very near our global anniversary date, which happens January 19th or starts January 19th around the world. We are in over 15, um, over 15 countries in uh, five continents around the world, you can find an event near you for the upcoming Women's Wave on our anniversary page and also read through the toolkit to end violence against women. We have outlined all of the different ways that we can think of that women experience violence around the world and also some stats to support why this is such um, a, 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 an important issue to really um, push forth in regards to the Women's Wave anniversary. So join us at an event near you. January 19th and 20th, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you so much, and thank you to Natalie.